and welcome to Talk Art. I'm Sally Rain, and I'll be your host as we delve into the world of the artist and the art that's all around us. Talk Art is sponsored by the Silicon Valley Open Studios. During the first three weekends in May, hundreds of local artists open our studios to the public. For more information, you can go to the website svos.org. Our guest, James Lee, is a multimedia artist who creates fantastical symbolic paintings that tell very interesting stories. And he's here to show us some of his techniques and share some of the stories that go along with them. So welcome, James. Thank you very much, Sally. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about your background. How did you sure. become involved with art? OK, I, um, I always light was drawn to art when I was in my early toddler years, I had a rubber frog just wearing a sort of a speedo. I used to draw pictures of him. And then much later on, when I was in my late teens and early 20s and trying to get my work with galleries, I started to do a lot of um, intaglio printmaking. I learned how to do engraving and etching. Oh, interesting. Um, because, because I was doing line drawing, and it was a way of making multiple copies of what I was doing. Um, then much later on, I've started to do more work over the last 20 years or so, more figurative work, um, more work that involves color, multimedia work. I've done a lot of work involving series. I did a series of drawings that were based on um, a combination of Smokey Robinson and the, um, the poem Afternoon of a Fawn, which is also a piece of music. You know, oh, fawns jumping around. Um, and so you have many, a variety of influences on your art. Yeah, I really try to have a lot of narratives, a lot of stories um, some of them are very pers more personal some of them are you know drawn from history or drawn from current events um, I've, I've been doing recently some work involving um, paleolithic drawings of, of cave people of, of um, you know uh, mega mammals that lived in the old days interesting and um, just a lot of different kinds of themes um, so where do you find these themes Is well so, some, of, some of them um, Smokey Robinson it was just fun. It was sort of a lyrical story. Um, I've been doing. I did one fairly recently that involved thinking about um, family and and people that I grew up with because my my background is sort of a mixed one. My mother was born in Hungary and she grew up there, and then eventually mm. she married my father when he um, was working for the U.S. government in the State Department right after World War II, and so she had to leave Hungary because of communism and she had endured living through uh, Hungary uh, during World War II when it was very, very heavily bombed by everybody, pretty much. 78% of the buildings in Budapest oh, wow. were either destroyed or damaged. And so she became part of, in a sense, a group of people that really had to leave their home country. There were you know, hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people right. who had survived the war, and then they had to go to different countries and you know, couldn't really live in Hungary anymore because they belonged to the wrong social class. There was a very repressive form of communism um, that had taken over in Hungary um, in the early years after the war. So and you have a series of paintings that reflect these people and your family influences. That's correct. Yeah, so let's take a look at those now. Sure. Okay. And you can tell us some more about each individual person's stories with the paintings that are there. Sure, okay, this is one. The series was called Sphinx Series. And I, I, they, it sort of came gradually, but I realized I was thinking a lot about some of the stories my mother had told me and that I've heard from other family members, people that I kind of grew up with that um, we used to visit a lot in the East Bay back in the 60s and early 70s. Anyhow, this um, picture is one of the series, and it has a bunch of light motifs which really relate to the kind of life that a lot of these people had and that they left behind. Stories that I heard that became sort of part of my, my consciousness that I share, you know, a historic consciousness that I share with them. Um, some of the imagery, the, the swans, in a sense, allude to the kind of lifestyle that they lived in the period between the wars. Hungary had become a much smaller country because of um, losing its territory after World War I. It was right. old-fashioned, somewhat aristocr aristocratically oriented, um, not really a democracy, full-fledged, but not a repress not a dictatorship either they had a regent instead of a king um, and a lot of people that if they were you know living well they had really nice lifestyles they would go to castles that were owned by their friends wow. and go to a lot of parties go to balls dancing it was kind of a, 
a society where there was a lot of leisure, there was a lot of time spent with other people, a lot of social events that were shared. And the swans really allude to that kind of a lifestyle. And the swans were actually, I cut them out of some paper that I found that was being used as dust covers of these old pictures. They, they, in, in Hungary, apparently used that type of material as a dust cover on the back of oh, framed artwork um, the, in, during, between the wars. So I made a frisket and cut, that, cut out lots of swans, um, cool. representing sort of the lifestyle of the Strauss waltzes, the um, weekends spent together at somebody's country estate, um, people living very happy and lifestyles. What is the significance of the paper airplanes? The paper airplanes are sort of a hint of what's to come, but oh. at this point, not really a disguised hint. I mean, they are airplanes. And as I mentioned, you know, there was a tremendous amount of bombing that was done Right. all over Europe in World War II and probably as much in Hungary as anywhere else. So that's kind of a hint of things to come, but you can still see that in that picture, people are going to balls, they're dancing, young, young women are being introduced to society, these that sorts of things. This one also follows some of the same themes. Um, the, big, the big crescent and the moon has become sort of a croissant in this case. <laughs> um, which represents actually the, the croissants were introduced by the Turks when they occupied Hungary for 300 years. Wow. So in a sort of a backhanded way, it's a symbol of occupation, but it's a nice shape too. So you have a lot of background in all of these symbols that you're using. Yeah, and they can mean more things to other people that they may not oh, mean. Oh, yeah, of course. You know, certain associations that I have, like the swans, you know, clearly for me that's because of the dust covers and something that not everyone would know about. But, right. Um, that's yeah, part part of the part of the theme that's included in this picture. That again, you can still see people are still try, enjoying life, trying to live you know decent lives, not knowing yet of the cataclysm that's about to come, World War Two. And what are those circles at the bottom, the colorful ones? Well, I was sort of thinking of Damon Hirst a little bit, but not really. Oh. I mean, <laughs> um, those are actually blown up. If you take a, a just an ordinary color image and you blow it up on your copying machine onto uh, photo paper, you create these sort of multicolored blobby sort of things and you can cut them out into circles. And to me, they represent, they're sort of memes that represent pure color, which could be pure oh, sensuality, pure experience of, of life. Very interesting. And then the, the circles in the background? Oh, those, those are, well, just rainbow, just sort of yeah. things are still going pretty nicely. And another circle theme. Yeah, there's some more the circles. The violins, of course, play into the, the waltzes. The, the gypsy music, of course, which is very traditional for Hungary. Um, the, the crowns, which represent the rem remnants of uh, aristocratic society. Um, there's the onion, which is sort of a, I mean, I wouldn't expect people to get this. It's a little bit of an allusion to um, Günter Grass's tin drum where at the end of World War II, the Germans would, um, they would have a special, this is supposed to be a satire, that they would um, have public performances in movie theaters where somebody would cut open an onion and everybody would start crying. Oh, no. And so that's a little bit of an illusion of that. Wow, so you've done so much historical research to have the backgrounds of these paintings come alive. Well, yeah, trying to bring a lot of that in there. and and. Um, clouds, you can see I mean, the clouds could be taken, I think, as a sign of um, the, the future won't be quite so bright anymore. And the sun and moon, which is a little bit of very traditional symbols of in Hungary, Transylvania, which is the eastern part that is now part of um, Romania. But anyhow, still representing, you know, the, the undisturbed traditional lifestyle that people were still living during, during the 30s. And here you can see the beginning of war, the red, of course, oh, kind of wow, gives that yeah. idea, I think. You can see the fighting of different kinds of animals. You know, we're get, getting into a rather Orwellian, Orwellian situation. There's, <laughs> a, there's a, uh, one of the pieces. You mean animal farm? Well, no. <laughs> no. 19, yeah, and yeah. 1984. Yeah, it could yeah. be animal farm, too. Um, of course, a few violins, a swan. But this time now we have a, a howitzer um, tank, right. I mean, a, a, yeah. a, a big gun. And at the bottom is where one of the Hungarian friends who was a bachelor moved after he came to the United States. He was able to keep some money and he bought a ranch right next to Soledad Prison. And we used to go out there. And that's the way the ranch used to always look. And 
Um, wow, is that where you heard stories about what well, happened Well, he in the himself past? was a story. He was one of right. the most interesting stories wow. I've ever known as a human being. But he had this beautiful ranch out on this immense flat plain. Oh, you could see forever from it, and um, that's that's the way it looked. That was that was you know his final place where he lived. And this is you know the way also I was interested in the way different people adapt different ways right. to their experience of having to leave. People leave, you know, maybe in, in their former country, because this happened in countries other than Hungary. In the former right. country, maybe they owned a bank. Now they have the most, now they work as a janitor in a bank. People that had to learn a new language after not speaking at all any English, they would have to come here and learn English from scratch. And maybe that by now they're already 55 years right. old. It isn't that That's easy. A very difficult transition. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes people have to hide things. They have to, you know, hide things from themselves and not allow themselves to experience certain emotions because right. it would drive them crazy. So that that theme with the with the sack that's closed, that kind of hints, to, hints at that. The things that people need to conceal or that they feel they have to kind of keep under wraps because because the experience that they're, they've experienced is just too difficult. A lot right. of people went through post-traumatic stress disorder in those years, although we. Didn't, didn't know, know that was yeah, what we didn't it was know how called. To call it that. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of people that had been some people had been in camps. Some people were sent in Siberia. Wow. Um, Three hundred thousand people from Hungary came back from Siberia. Six hundred thousand were sent there. Half of them wow. didn't make it back. Um, I know some people that made it back. My wife's father did. And um, well, this looks a little different. Well, this is sort of after they've come here, and some of them have successfully adapted to become. Um, electrical engineers, and now they're teaching at the University of Kansas or something, or mm. art history at Dominican College or someplace. So there's a certain adaptation to the new environment. Um, the bats symbolize, I think to me, they would represent kind of good luck. I think bats are kind of nice, although I wouldn't want to have one as a bat. Um, <laughs> no, they're very useful too. Yeah, very useful. And they're, they're Hungary has lots of bats. Oh, they're, they're very much in the, uh, in the skies at night, at dusk. and. Um, so this one, and, and the circle in the middle, that kind of represents a symbol of life, of fecundity, the spiral. And so that shows life goes on, things, people adapt. Cool. Well, you have some tools that we can sure. take a look at that will show one of your techniques that you use. Okay. As I mentioned, I started doing engraving when in, I was in my late teens because it was a way of producing multiple images up to that, that point. I was kind of kind of shy about my art, so most of it was done with um, pen and ink drawings, and I thought I could make lots of copies by doing engraving. So this here is a typical engraved plate. I did it around 1972 or so. Oh, wow. And, so um, it's copper, right? And it's on copper. It's mm -hmm. a thin sheet of copper. First, you have to get it very, very smooth using various um, abrasive materials, like this, this is one example. It's a, a stone that you wear it down gradually by rubbing on the surface, particularly for correcting mistakes. Um, a typical uh, engraving tool is called a burin. So hold it over the... Sure. And it's, it's held in your hand like this. So you're sort of actually pushing. So it's very different from the regular motion of drawing or painting, which is more of a pull motion. So you actually push it through the surface. A lot of people will move the plate themselves as they push through the surface in order to get a curved line. Oh, um, you can curve a certain amount on your own without having to do it that way. So this is actually a square. Uh, a tang, they call this the strip of metal a tang, and it's cut at a 45 degree angle, so you get the point that way. And the point, you know, has to be sharpened very often because you're cutting metal on metal. Right. And like, you just push it like this. And then um, normally that will create a V shaped trench, which is where the ink will go later on. But it also creates this little uplift on each side, and you have to remove that, otherwise, you're going to get a very muddy surface. This is a three sided scraper. And it's used for scraping off that excess copper on the sides. Oh, so the little e rough edges? Yeah, to get yeah. those rough edges oh. away. Okay. And then if you need to make it even smoother, this is a, a burnishing tool. And you would you know, rub it gently on the surface and get it very, very smooth using this as a technique. So what other shapes do you have in the tools over Well, there? there's a lot of these others. You can use them for engraving. They're not as useful as these are. These are really... You know, the, the superstar of engraving, of course, was Albrecht Dürer. Right. And um, so, I mean, to do that kind of work or to do a plate like this one, we'll have an image of this and another one 
Oh, but to do that kind of work, you really need one of these, and you, you know, it's going is to be... Is that the main tool that you use? Yeah. Oh, and Albrecht Durer used that just one He probably tool? used a very similar one. Wow. And the other point to mention is that you, you, the angle at which you hold it will determine the thickness of the line. So if you lift it up like this, it's going to dig much deeper and create oh. a, a deeper line. If you do it like this, most of the cuts are like this. You kind of push it along and you create a more shallow, uh, more delicate line. And, um, and it really started, they were making playing cards. In the early 1400s, there was the master of the playing cards, who was one of the first engravers. Oh, and in those wow. days, instead of having um, kings and queens and sp uh, spades and hearts and so forth, they had um, fish, I mean, not fish, uh, plants, birds, uh, deer, uh, br animals, uh, carnivorous animals, oh, interesting. and wild men. Those were the, f the five suites, so they had five instead of four like we have today. Cool. And so the master of playing cards had made engravings, which we still have today, which were used in his time as playing cards. And then there was Martin Schengauer, who was another very big engraver, and that kind of led to Dürer. And of course, everybody knows Dürer's St. Jerome and Melancholia yeah, and all, all of those great. Of but you can really see the detail. incredible extent of of technical prowess that he was able to achieve. Wow. And an awful lot of... Did he also use copper? Yeah, everybody used yeah. copper. You can't Very really grainy. use it's not like zinc because it's too soft. Mm -hmm. Woodcut would usually be a relief. And some people, a lot of people did relief. In, um, and you could use, actually, some of these other tools here would be good for relief work. Like if you cut into so end grain Turkish boxwood and you would use something, this is a much thicker point and it's flat. So if you want to remove a large amount of material, you could do it off of wood. You couldn't really do it off of metal because the metal is too resistant. Right. But I have, you know, these cool. are, I mean, just sort of very neat looking instruments that unfortunately don't get used as much as they, you would like to, but they would be very good for, for cutting into, into wood or something like that. And um, cool. the, all kinds of different points, rounded points, flat points. I even have one that has cuts about five, not five lines at once. You would hold it like that. Um, very thin lines, cool. of course. Awesome. So you yeah. have some pictures of engravings that sure, you do. brought and yes. then some other very right. interesting paintings. So let's okay. take a look at those now. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that's the first of the two that I brought. That's the first really, the first engraving I ever did was a picture of Mozart. It didn't come out terribly well. Um, but anyhow, this one came out better, I think. And it has a lot of detail, as you can see, a lot Lots of detail. Lots of detail. Wow. And it's on the copper plate, of course. And, um, and it was just, some of it was a little bit of a learning experience because I made mistakes and then I would have to laboriously scrape the area where the mistake was and then smooth it down again so that when we finally get to printing the thing, um, there won't be a, a blurry or smudgy um, area where, right. where the image is done. And so that's, that's the first one of the two that I brought. And um, it, as you, it, it took an enormously long time. To oh, do I these. can imagine. There really a lot of work involved in doing them. And of course, eyesight too. I, I think a lot <laughs> yeah, of people, you have to yeah, you have to wear magnifying glasses. In those days, I didn't, but um, today I certainly would. Um, but that's yeah, that's and that's the second one. This took almost as long. How also, large are these? Is that the size? That, well, this that, that one the... is, is is this picture here. Okay. Oh. And so you can see it's it's copper. smaller than a sheet of letter paper folded in half. And I'm sure it took I don't know God knows how many dozens of hours to do it and you can make maybe 35 to 50 copies and and then it starts to wear down i've never made a super large amount i've usually stopped at around 40. Um, if somebody wanted to make a lot more you could have the surface faced with steel but uh, the process of copying of making a print you put um rub ink into the lines using um you can just rub it in by hand or you can use a tool like a squeegee type thing mm -hmm. and then once you get into the lines you have to get it out of everywhere else which is by rubbing the surface in a circular motion with a kind of a rough cloth called a tarlatan and you use several different grades and then eventually you get all the ink off and you run it through an old-fashioned press a big old press a big old press <laughs> yeah, indeed. it's one of the huge a ones. real big one now this is something different this is is this is much newer work than yeah this is a much that. more recent series i did there's four of them it's called peacock angel and all of them have a peacock fan like central motif which you can see in the middle this one mm -hmm. has a very big one with a big blue and so that's a light motif that's repeated in the picture 
the theme I got, the idea I got for the theme was reading about this um, group that lives in, it's a religious and ethnic group that lives in northern Iraq called the Yazidis. Uh -huh. And they have a syncretistic religion where they believe, um, they believe that there was an angel named Melek Taus who was one of the archangels. And when God created Adam and, Adam and Eve, he asked Melek Taus and the other archangels to bow to Adam. And Melek Taus says, I refuse to do that because you created me out of divine essence and you create Adam out of dust. Why should I bow to him? Oh. And so in our religion, a lot of the West that may emphasize a certain amount of obedience, they would say that he's the guy that gets, gets to go to hell. But in, in the Yazidi religion, um, at least the way it's been explained, he actually goes into God's favor, and he's the intermediary between people and God. Oh, um, interesting. But I got interested in that idea, just the idea of an angel that stands, you know, that kind of stands up rather than religion being used as an instrument of obedience, um, you know, that it would suggest a certain freedom that, um, you know, to, to do things that way. Um, so that's the first of the series. That's the that's another uh, second in the series. Um, there's certain other themes that are repeating themselves. So um, what materials are you using for all these? All kinds of stuff. The, the, the peacock fans are, are made using this kind of tape that people use to measure off things in their garden <laughs> or, or you know, tie up plants that right. so they don't fall over. And it, it glues very well with acrylic glue. And so they, and you can just cut off the, the strips and then lay them down mm -hmm. in, a, in a pattern like that, a, a fan-shaped pattern. Then I used also, I used um, magnified and shrunk images from a book of transistors from the 60s. Oh, interesting. Um, because they looked like ancient writing. I thought this could be, you know, the world's <laughs> oldest writing from 9700 BC. And, you know, the, when you make, really magnify it, it becomes very fuzzy. And you can say that's even older. That's the first form of writing that this particular cool. group did. And so I, I repeated those a lot. In yeah, the, in interesting the way of looking at objects and images and putting them together and having them mean something completely different. Oh, thanks. Yeah, but yeah, because they were supposed to do that. And also playing with, with, with the idea of perspective and seeing things close and far. Like the two little arches on the lower right are actually looking up and down in this large metal cage, which was used to climb up the side of a cathedral being fixed in Europe, seeing things from both directions. Yeah, this is number three of the of the um, Peacock Angel series, and um, a lot of the same themes. I did a lot of work on the side. These are museum uh, canvases, so it's about one and a third inches right. thick. And so I thought I should use the side of the canvas as part of the picture. So all, all of these oh, so have you, stuff painted oh, on the sides. I see. So the, those strips are what's actually on the side of the canvas. Yeah, right. It's kind of oh, tricky to photograph. Cool. You have to take it, the picture four times. But yeah, that's five times, really. But that's how I did that. And, um, and so also a lot of images using um, stuff hanging down from the top, just using different areas of the space, you know, in a different way, I thought, than, than yeah. usually, usually being used. And, and um, yeah, and then this, this one here is the last of the series. And you can see there again, there's, there's more of the, um, of, of the peacock shapes. Right. One yeah. character that I, uh, one individual historically that I showed several times in the whole story was Giordano Bruno, who was a, a Renaissance scientist, really. And he decided that the Earth goes around the sun and not vice versa. But he was a few years before Galileo, so they executed him. They burned him at the stake. Oh. But I thought, you know, here was somebody that was really right about that. And unfortunately, he wasn't rewarded for his. Um, and so his image is in your painting? Yeah, because, he, in, you know, like Galileo, he did, in fact, stand up to established right. wisdom, to authority. And, you know, how important it is, I think, for people to, to, to be able to do that, you know, responsibly, certainly, but to be able to do that. They're interesting colors, too. I really like them. Thanks. Yeah, so you have all these different kinds of paintings. Where can people see them? Well, I've got a studio at 275 Linden in Redwood City, and there's about two groups of artists there. There's probably about 20, or close to 20 of us that are there. Um, I'm always in open studio, well, the Silicon Valley <laughs> open studios. There's going to be a Redwood City open studio, the miniature version of it, mm -hmm. in early December. Um, I have a bunch of work right now, drawings of birds that are in a, um, in a, in a coffee shop, the, um, Phil's Coffee Shop Crossroads in Cupertino. 
I'm going oh. to be in a group show commemorating the original form of Halloween, Sam Hain, at the Neologian Gallery in Redwood City this Saturday. Cool. And then we're also going to have a group show at the old courthouse, which is now a museum in Redwood City, and that's been going on for three years. They have it on November 17th, every year around November 17th. And then I've had other work at um, some other, other galleries and coffee shops and, you know, wherever, you know, where, where I can find places. Cool. So you, it sounds like you're very active in showing your work in group shows in the area. Yeah, so. I've been trying to do that. We had a gallery where I am. Unfortunately, we had to close it. Now it's a digital gallery called Branner Spangenberg Gallery. And I was actually mm. doing some, um, I wrote a blog for them also. It was kind of a art critic sort of thing, I suppose. And... Um, so yeah, then there's a lot of things that are a lot. I think the whole area is experiencing a lot of increased um, artistic activity. It seems good. Yeah, yeah, Redwood City seems to be a sort Absolutely. of a hub of art artistic. Oh yeah, there is. There's the a group moment. called Arts Redwood City that's been very instrumental, and I think a lot of the new businesses are fairly interested in supporting that too. Oh good. Yeah. So, what do you think some of the benefits are to Working in a group studio or doing open studios with groups of people, how does that work for I you? I think if you're in a group, it really helps because you're probably going to draw more people to the to the event if, if they know that they're going to see five artists versus just one, I think. So if, if people can be in groups, it probably does increase attendance. And I think Arts Red would say, I mean, um, Silicon Valley Open Studios has been really helpful because it's, it represents a really good way for a lot of people to show their art and you can actually do three weekends. I've done more than one e weekend on occasion. And it's a very good yeah. way, I think, for a lot, there's a lot of artists in the Bay Area. And it's a good way, I think, for a lot of people to interact with other artists and to network and to get their work out there. Great, well, I think as your art is very interesting. I love the stories that come with it Thanks. and the images, your colors are really interesting yeah. and you have a lot of variety in your art, which yeah. I, Find Thank fascinating. You. Thanks. That every symbol has a yeah. deep meaning. Yeah. Thanks. Excellent. Well, yeah. thank you so sure. much for being on Talk Art. Sure. This I did want to mention just one oh, thing sure. really quickly was, unfortunately, my mom was 98, oh. and she passed away last week, but she died very peacefully. And really, to be able to talk about some of these things, and thinking of her memory, and you know, the memories that she basically gave me, mm -hmm. telling about her life when she was young, and you know, meeting all of the people that she grew up with, and that was just such a really, really good experience in my life. Yeah, well, obviously the stories yeah. are wonderful. Thank you.